Why, why hasn't Apple bought $20 billion of Bitcoin and made $100 billion overnight yet? The answer is they're afraid and they have political constraints. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we have Michael Saylor giving us all the Bitcoin news today. He talks about the crash with Bitcoin and in the crypto market. Some would say Bitcoin is at a cyclical bottom. Today it's trading at less than half the all-time high and with great uncertainties that remain in financial markets, as demonstrated by price actions across equities, it will be interesting to see how Bitcoin bounces back. Proponents of Bitcoin have endorsed the digital currency as an inflation hedge, in part because there is a finite amount of it, but Bitcoin has tumbled hard along with stocks. Saylor remains bullish despite market conditions, only this time it's combined with record highs in inflation and the market as a whole. Let's check out what Michael Saylor has to say regarding his outlook for 2022. This is Library of Wealth. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. Remember when I tweeted to Elon, I said, you know, you, you know, don't, I didn't say buy a billion worth of Bitcoin. I said buy 10 billion worth of Bitcoin and then issue $10 billion of converts and buy 10 billion more and you make 100 billion and then all the S&P follows you and you make a trillion. Well, he didn't quite do that, right? I mean, he did a little, I'm okay with the billion and a half, but the point is, why doesn't someone do a $25 billion buy at Google? And the answer is because of politics and institutional inertia. And, uh, you know, some people don't want the trillion. Okay, so why doesn't a government do it? Politics, institutional inertia. When will they do it? Well, you know that this is the butterfly effect, right, guys? It's like, how do you predict when someone gets whacked on the side of the head and knocked out of their comfort zone and decides to go and bend over and pick up the trillion dollars? <laughs> so I don't know, right? Like, uh, my real point is any of a thousand people could do it and maybe none of them will do it. But if you're betting that not a single one of them wants the trillion dollars, I mean, it seems to me like over a decade, somebody wants the trillion dollars. I just don't know who will have the courage and the clarity of conviction to do it. Why, why hasn't Apple bought $20 billion of Bitcoin and made $100 billion overnight yet? The answer is they're afraid and they have political constraints. Saylor goes on to talk about the collapse in currencies and why this is important, especially when it relates to investing in Bitcoin. Here he gives the timeline on how long currencies have before they'll collapse and exactly why gold isn't a viable option. Saylor gives his take on why you can't just save money and increase your net worth when the economy isn't growing at the same rate as the money supply. They're afraid of their shareholders. The accounting makes it ugly. So, you know, you wonder why don't they just bend over and make a trillion dollars? Currencies continue to weaken. Second, uh, second tier currencies collapse. Third tier currencies all collapse. The first year tier currencies weaken 15, 20%. And I think if, if we come back to the big theory of money here, right? Under the gold standard, if the dollar was backed by gold, it, it was stable to Mark's point. But if we thought about it deeply, gold is not perfect money. Gold has actually got a half-life of 35 years. The reason the dollar was stable was the economy was growing on average 2% a year, and the supply of money on average was growing at 2% a year. And if, if both of those things peg, and if you're an economist, you realize it's almost impossible to grow anything more than 2 or 3% a, a year over the course of a long period of time. So, so what you had was stable money in the form of gold. We never had good money. Right? We never had hard money. If we had perfect money, the value of the dollar wouldn't have stayed constant. The value of the dollar would have increased by 2 to 3% a year. Mm -hmm. And over the course of 30 years, you would have doubled your wealth by just saving money or, or more. And everything just keeps getting cheaper. With fiat currency, you have rampant inflation, which equates to 7 to 8% each year that the dollar is being inflated. Michael Saylor lays out why even the best currency loses 99% of its value over 100 years, and every other currency will lose 100% of its value. The devaluing of money tracks with the S&P index as well, which makes this current cycle we're in something to watch. Under perfect money, you have deflation. Under gold money, you have constant prices. Mm -hmm. Under fiat money, you have 
rampant inflation. And most people, they've got this fiction that, you know, even if you look at official government documents, they keep talking about purchasing power and they calculate it based on CPI and they tell you that your money lost 95% of its value. That is not true, right? If you look at, if you look at the last hundred years, take the US dollar, I'm sitting in a house that cost $100,000 in 1930. I have the bill of sale on the wall and Zillow thinks it's worth $28 million right now. The money lost 99.5% of its value over 80 to 90 years. Mm -hmm. And if you back calculate the real loss of purchasing power against a market basket of scarce assets of the US dollar, you conclude that we're really inflating the currency seven to eight percent a year every year for a hundred years. It happens to correlate closely with the S&P index, which has been going up 10 percent a year for a hundred years. The we're back to my two percent economic growth point of view, which is you get the money supply plus two or three percent in the economy. Once you do that, what you realize is the very best currency loses 99.5% or 99.8% of its value over 100 years. Every other currency loses 100% of its value over 100 years. If currency in dollars were to be used as the Treasury Reserve asset, you're giving 99% of your assets to the government. With gold losing 2% of its value per year, it's not a viable option either. Saylor gives his analogy of why currency derivatives aren't sustainable long term. Now, the real question is, what do you adopt as your treasury reserve asset? And if it's, if it's currency and currency derivatives in dollars, you have made the institutional decision to surrender 99.5% of your assets to the government over the course of, of uh, 80, 90 years. I guess the metaphor would be, what if I, you know, Anthony, what if I told you I was going to make you 20 years older so that I could be 20 years younger? <laughs> And what if, Mark, what if I told you I was going to take all of your children and accelerate their age to age 75 so that I, at age 65, could be rolled back to 30 because I'm so brilliant that I know your future and I should, I should run yep. the country for you for another 30 years? What you really have is a parasitic situation where you're siphoning off the life force and the energy from uh, the working class to the property class from the free market to the centrally controlled government mark to the government it's the story of every empire every city state every country and and the only choice you had uh in the last ten thousand years was maybe gold but gold was never perfected money it was always and it's double imperfect right it's losing two percent of its value a year and also is getting debased by whoever controls the mint and it's also getting seized. So gold is like triple imperfect money. China and Russia found out the hard way that having a treasury reserve strategy of fiat currency doesn't work. And now they'll have to look to something besides gold because the half-life of the dollar is five years and the half-life of every other currency is three years. Saylor explains why Bitcoin is the perfect solution. We didn't have anything that looked like theoretically perfect money until January 3rd, 2009. And then it took about 10 years of beating on it to determine that it wasn't going to crumple under some kind of uh, engineering mistake. And so now here you are in the year 2022 and reasonable, intelligent people have concluded that this is engineered perfect money. That's like two, three, four percent of the marketplace. Ninety seven percent of the people yeah. don't even know what money means. And, and if you don't know what money is, then you couldn't actually go on a search for engineered perfect money. If you look at the Russians and the Chinese, they've all been hit with a two by four in the head. And they've been invited to consider whether or not a Treasury Reserve strategy of holding fiat currency and credit derivatives is, in fact, perfect money. And now they know it isn't perfect. And they either have to look back to the 19th century and gold which was the best idea for 10,000 years, but a crappy idea that failed mm -hmm. 5,000 times. And we know why, because it's centralized and you can debase it. Or you roll forward to the 21st century and you ask, is there a better idea? And Bitcoin is the better idea. What's gonna happen? Intelligent people are gonna watch YouTube and they're gonna realize that the currency has a half-life. The US dollar had a half-life of 10 years. 
and now it has a half-life of five years. Mm -hmm. And every other currency has a half-life of three years. Gold has a half-life of 30 years. Bitcoin has a half-life of forever, infinite, forever. Once people figure that out, you have a mass exodus, you know, an evacuation, not from Europe to the new world, but from real space to cyberspace. The money goes from analog to digital, and it goes from unencrypted to encrypted. And the only place you can run to save your life force by being having all the energy sucked out of your body is you have to encrypt your life force right on a network, which is beyond nation state control. And there's one of them. I think that's what happens, right? I mean, the intelligent people are going to exit, right, on a, you know, on an arc of encrypted energy. And and the ignorant ones are not going to exit and they're going to have the life force sucked out of them. So to Mark's point, right? What's the ratio between half-life of infinity divided by 35 years? <laughs> How much better is Bitcoin infinity versus 35 years of gold? A Bitcoin maximalist often wants to have enough Bitcoin to live comfortably in time and space. They probably also desire a more equitable and just economy, which is why they embrace Bitcoin in the first place. A maximalist should also believe that having billions of individuals possessing a small amount of Bitcoin is preferable to having a few million holding all of it. Buying the dip benefits not just those who are most invested in Bitcoin, but it also helps with further distribution by attracting new entrants, which is a good thing. Comment down below on what you think of Michael Saylor's position. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Library of Wealth. We'll see you in the next video.